Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a very distinct privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Ron Raboud is the businessman. He's the owner and CEO of the Rabco Corporation. They design and manu manufacture and construct lightweight uh, steel installations. But that's not what he's going to talk with you tonight about. Ron looked at what was happening to the many men and women that were coming back from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, the hideous injuries and the challenges that our warriors, our heroes, and our wounded warriors face. He started an organization. There are no staff, 100% of the dollars that Wounded Warrior Outdoors raise goes to the Warriors. Wild Sheep Foundation is a very close partner with Wounded Warrior Outdoors and we typically raise about a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars for them through your generosity. Ron Schauer, Ron and Marlis, huge supporters. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO and founder of Wounded Warrior Outdoors, Mr. Ron Raboud. Good evening. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, one thing I'm real glad about is the light shining in my eyes. I can't see how many people are out here, so I'm nervous enough without it. The journey that brings me here tonight is not one that I ever saw coming. Never, never, never thought I would ever be standing here. It's so far out of the box for me, you can't imagine. The beginning actually happened on an elk hunt. And it was an elk hunt that I've done with friends for many years. I've been a lifelong hunter, and it's, hunting is a big part of my life. It was the begin, at the end of the first morning, and we went back to the lodge expecting to see happy hunters and big bull elk on the ground. But when we got back, we got back to total silence, and this is what we were greeted with. Our version of Pearl Harbor, and our lives will be forever changed. As many of you know, the airports and the airlines were shut down for many days. I was several thousand miles away from home and no means of getting there. So we did the only thing we could do, rented a vehicle and drove. We were driving from New Mexico to Florida, and I can honestly tell you that there's a hell of a lot of time to think and reflect between that drive or on that drive. My first thoughts were of the lives that were lost so tragically those days, followed by the lives that were certain to be lost, because I knew that as a nation, we wouldn't let these acts go unanswered, and I knew it would be our warriors that would be answering them. And at that time, I thought of the warriors in my life, the ones that actually introduced me to hunting. My dad, my cousin Tom, and my cousin Donnie. And I was thinking about them. They had a lot in common. And one of the things they had in common was that they were all wounded warriors. My dad was wounded in the invasion of France in World War II. And he spent two years in the hospital healing from wounds that, to be honest with you, I never understood until quite recently. My cousin Tom did two tours of Vietnam and received two Purple Hearts. And my cousin Donnie paid the ultimate sacrifice and was killed in 1970 at the age of 19. And it was about that time in the drive when something very different happened. A different feeling welled up inside of me, a feeling of immense guilt. And it's that guilt that's inspired me or propelled me to come up here and do what we're doing. The guilt I had was that I never did anything. I never served my country. By the sheer luck of a birth date, I was too young for Vietnam and too old for the conflicts to come. And I just felt like I didn't do what I was raised to do, and that was carry my weight and do my share. I struggled with that for quite a while because I really couldn't think of how a guy in his 40s could possibly serve his country or make up for what he didn't do. 
And coincidentally, I had met a couple warriors on a business flight, wounded warriors coming back to Orlando from San Antonio. And I was doing what I always do. I was reading a hunting magazine. And they started bantering back and forth about the desire to hunt. One had hunted, one had always hunted and never had the opportunity. And I just couldn't understand why they didn't, why they never made that happen. And they explained to me that they were, had been wounded in Afghanistan and that they were on their way back to, from the hospital to a weekend at Disney World. They'd always wanted to hunt, but they just didn't have the ability or the means to do so. And I finally figured out at that time, at that night, that somehow I was going to find a way to make that happen. And I tried to do that for a couple of years, but it didn't work out real well because it was very hard to find deserving people and very hard to reach the people at the stage of their recovery that we wanted to reach. A few years later, we requested a meeting with the medical staff at Walter Reed. And in that staff meeting, we were investigating the opportunities we would have or how we could reach the warriors that were constantly or, or being treated at that time. And the staff noticed something about hunting that I never noticed and that I never saw. And they, they said that there was a therapeutic value there that could be highly instrumental in motivating our warriors to heal. And it's at that time, in that meeting, that WWO began. It was the recognition of the staff, of the abilities and, the, and the, what hunting provides that we as hunters look past, or at least I as a hunter look past. I was very happy that we were going to form a partnership with our, with our hospitals, because the way our program works, like Gray said, we're 100% volunteer. We're not affiliated with any other organization. Our focus is on our warriors and only on our warriors. We do not select the warriors that take part in our program. The warriors that are selected are, are selected by the medical staff at the hospitals we work with. They're selected not because they like to hunt. They're selected by, because of the therapeutic value and the therapeutic potential that the hunts provide. I got to tell you that prior to hosting our first hunt, I just was very skeptical. I didn't see the therapeutic value. The very first hunt that we had, we had a young Marine, a scout sniper. He was injured in an IED explosion four months before this trip. He lost both his legs, all of his fingers on one hand, and his thumb and partial fingers on the other. This was his first trip out of the hospital since being wounded. And we took him right out of the hospital, right into the fields of British Columbia on a spot and stalk bear hunt. If you look at this picture, it's very easy to see the fear in his face. He's so far out of his element, his thoughts are not of a bear hunt, his thoughts are about falling. His thoughts are about injuring himself. Everything is uncomfortable to him. A few days later, or later on that same day actually, he's still struggling to walk. He's got his crutch, he's got a death grip on his guide. He's just, he's not into the hunt. He's, he, it's so far off his radar screen, it's not even what he's thinking about. But things begin to change. A day or so later, he's walking by himself, He's gaining confidence that he never thought he would have, and he's doing so because of the motivation that a hunt provides. Shortly after this picture was taken, we drove through that poplar grove that's over his shoulder, and we bumped a bear. And for those of you who bear hunt, you know that bears are hard to judge, and if you try to convince yourself that the bear is big, he probably isn't. But when you see a no-brainer, there's no question, and this bear was a no-brainer. And about that time, everybody's instincts kicked in. I, I grabbed a rangefinder. Dave, the outfitter, grabbed the binoculars, and we were tracking the bear. And we hollered at Aaron, and we said, get out of the truck and shoot that bear. I was calling out the ranges, and the last thing I remember was saying 265 yards, the bear was walking through the poplar grove, and a shot rang out, and the bear dropped in his cracks. And about that time, we were looking at each other, and we're going, how the hell did that just happen? How did, Ryan, did Aaron get out of the truck? How did he grab the rifle? How did he get the safety off? And how did he hold it? Because up until that time, he had been so dependent on everybody 
that he wasn't able to function without help. But at that moment, the motivation of the hunt kicked him into autopilot, and he did what Marines do. He improvised, attacked, adapt, and overcame. And when he pulled that trigger, to a certain degree, he was whole again. He was a different kid. This is Aaron with that bear. He realized that he may have to do things differently, but he was capable of doing everything that he wanted. The rest of that trip, he was just one of the guys. There was no crutch. There was no walking holding on to anybody. He's holding a drink probably that he wasn't old enough to have and just enjoying the hunt. From that moment on, I never doubted the therapeutic value of the hunt. The way our program works is we do not shower our warriors with gifts. That's not what we're about. We're helping on them on their healing journey. To do so, what we do is we equip our destinations with everything possible that we may need to host our warriors. Because we never know what injuries we're going to have or what challenges we're going to have until about two weeks before our warriors show up. As we go back to our destinations, we try our best to be invisible. We try our best to fly under the radar screen. Because for us to properly help our warriors heal, they have to be a comfortable environment away from the spotlights, away from the media circus. We're there to support them. We're not there to exploit them. And that's a path we will never do. In doing so and trying to be invisible, trying to fly under the radar screen and not draw attention to ourselves, we raise curiosity in the communities. And as that curiosity peaks, people come forward to help. And they want to help. And they want to be involved. What happens is that the hunting, the killing aspect of what we do, is no longer a part of the focus. It's no longer on anybody's radar screen. It becomes insignificant. And we as hunters, we've become so accustomed to the Cecil Lion debacles and the black rhino deals that we faced in Dallas a few years ago. We've come to accept that, and I came to accept that. And as a hunter, what I would do is I would retreat to the closet and I would not want to incite any of those confrontations. In my opinion, anybody that doesn't hunt was the enemy. Anybody who doesn't hunt does not understand what we do. But this program has proven that wrong to me. People have the ability to see beyond the kill. And as they do, they come out in tremendous support of us. My wife and I own a ranch in, British, in uh, Kentucky. It's a town of about 600 people. And our event there has become a community event. It's become one of the biggest things that happen in that community. For those of you who hunt in the East, you know that there's an absence of public land to hunt. So if you don't have the means of owning land or have friends that own lands, you don't have the opportunity to hunt. This community that we have in Kentucky, I chose to buy our land there because there is not hunting pressure. There's high quality of game, there's an abundance of game, but the locals don't hunt. Everything is locked down. Over the years, and I'm watching us, the landowners have come forth. They provide us every meal. They open up over 80,000 acres of their own land to hunt. They don't even allow their own families to trespass the land until we're done. They, f they feed us every meal for every day that we're there. And if you look at this picture, the only ones in camo are our hunters. And it was just blowing me away that we were getting so much support from non-hunters supporting a hunting agency. I couldn't understand that. I couldn't believe it. And I wasn't willing to accept it as reality because of the, the cease of the lion deals. I kind of rationalized it to myself that, th that this was an agricultural community. This is an agricultural-based state. It's just nothing like this would ever happen in the big towns. The Kentucky State Parks Department and Kentucky Fish and Wildlife began to implement programs where they would allow us to come and hunt state parks while other people were there. They wanted to do 
a, I'll call it a marketing campaign for lack of a better description. They wanted to show people, the bunny huggers, the tree huggers, the leaf peepers, that there was something beyond the kill that hunting was, was about. And they allowed us to hunt their state parks, their resort parks, where we go every year with a, with a group of warriors. We hunt in the park while the park is being used by non-hunters. They tested that program to see what the public resistance would be, and there was none. But I still couldn't buy into the fact that that willingness to support a non-hunters non to support us as hunters was there. And a little while after these, these pictures were taken, I received a call from a biologist with the state of Indiana. They had been talking to the biologist with Kentucky, and Kentucky had told them about the pilot program they did with us. And he wanted to know if I would be willing to participate with Indiana. He said they had a particular hunt that was involved in a city park surrounded by downtown Indianapolis. It was a highly controversial hunt. They tried to get approved for many, many years, but there was intense media coverage in a negative aspect and extensive protests. They'd never had a, a city commission or a mayor that was willing to sign off on the hunt. And they thought maybe with our involvement, they might stand a small chance of that happening. So I said, if you can get it approved, we'll figure out a way to make it happen. A little while later, he, well, probably about a month later, he called me back and he said they had unanimous approval from the city commission and the mayor had approved the hunt. The hunt was on. It was set for the two and a half days following Thanksgiving, but it was still highly controversial. We were coming into somewhat of a hostile environment. The park would be patrolled. All the entrances would be guarded. The media and the protesters would be kept outside and our hunters would be escorted in to hunt. And it was about that time that I said, you know, you gotta kinda give me a little bit of the particulars. Uh, we hadn't talked about bag limits, we hadn't talked about anything like that. And he said, well, what we'd like you to do is bring about 12 warriors, and in the two and a half days you're here, we'd really like you to kill about 400 deer. And I, I about fell out of my chair. A month or so later, we showed up. The park was patrolled like they said it would. The entrances were guarded. The media was there in full force, but there were no protesters. I fully expected the media to leave, but they didn't. Instead, what they did was they started talking to our warriors, listening to them, listening to the importance the hunt plays in their life and the, hunt, and the importance that the hunt plays in their recovery. And they went and aired it. And I was shocked with what they aired. We're gonna roll that video here in a minute, it's just a two, one little broadcast from, from one of the local stations there. And I want you to remember that what you're looking at is network television. This is not the hunting channel. These are media reporters that were going to cover controversy. They were going there to, to talk about the bad things hunters do. And this is what aired. Could you roll the video, please? Controversial deer hunt inside Indianapolis city limits wraps up tomorrow. Armed wounded veterans are trying to thin what the city says is an overpopulation of deer at Eagle Creek Park. That's where we find 24 hour news 8's Howard Monroe tonight with more on the hunt. Howard. Daniel, as you can see, the park is closed and it's been that way since yesterday when this hunt began. And this hunt almost didn't happen after a man sued to try to get the city to stop it. But now, after that lawsuit was tossed out, a group of 12 veterans from the group Wounded Warrior Outdoors are here on a mission. Jim Searcy's life changed forever 45 years ago. Well, I stepped on a landmine in Vietnam in January of 1969. The Florida man lost both legs and one of his arms that day but to hear him talk, you couldn't tell. We're actually the luckiest people in the world to be to be around, to be alive, to experience this opportunity here at the park. Sersley is with Wounded Warrior Outdoors, a group that travels the country taking part in controlled hunts. They're now at Eagle Creek Park to help thin its herd. That camaraderie and that opportunity to get together 
and you know, because we've known each other for a number of years now, and to get back together again, share that friendship, and just be uh, be out here and experience the outdoors. In Indianapolis, that camaraderie comes with controversy. The hunt started Friday after a judge threw out a lawsuit claiming the hunt was illegal. Larry Peevler filed the suit. This city is already <coughs> soaked in blood, and now they want to soak the park in blood. That's my objection. The city says the park has five to ten times more deer than it should, but critics say a study was never done to figure out how many deer are actually there. First and foremost, it would be nice to know how many deer are actually in the park. The Humane Society of the United States has urged the city to use more humane ways to control the deer population, like contraception or sterilization. The city, though, says those options are too expensive. Jim Sersley avoids the local controversy and says these hunts are their way of proving you can overcome tragedy. Life is just open to whatever successes you want to avail yourself to. Now, this hunt wraps up tomorrow. The city says that they will release how many deer were culled at a later date. Now, as for the venison, it will be donated to, to local food pantries. Now, if you would like to know more about the group Wounded Warrior Outdoors, you can go to our website, wishtv.com, and look for this story. Live outside Eagle Creek Park, Howard Monroe, 24-Hour News 8. I never expected that, as I don't think you did either. I can't tell that bunny hugger how many deer are in the park, but I can tell her how many aren't. <laughs> we ended up killing just under 200 deer, and I give the guys a hard time and I get a variety of excuses. If I ask Jim why they didn't kill, kill the, the 400 deer the guys wanted, he said because we had too many Marines there and everybody knows Marines can't shoot. If I ask the Marines why they didn't kill their deer, they blame it on the Army. They said we had Army guys there that were so old they couldn't see the deer, and they were using weapons they used back in the Civil War. The good thing is we get to go back. The, the newscast followed up on that and did some additional broadcasts on us. We ended up having 4,800 pounds of venison processed and donated to the local food banks that resulted in 16,000 meals. It, it was at that time that I realized that we as hunters have to bear some of the burden for the lack of support we receive. The support is out there, and it's willing to come in our direction, but we must have to educate. We must have to tell those people the good things we do. And I've learned and seen firsthand that if we take that spotlight off the kill, that support is willing to come in our direction. I'm often asked to explain just what is Wounded Warrior Outdoors and what do we do? And that's a valid question, and it deserves a valid answer. If, I were, if you were asking me that question, and I would answer that to you here tonight, the first thing I would ask you is, although we're a highly efficient and highly effective charity, please don't see us as one. Because my fear is that if you saw us as a charity, you would look at the injuries. And if you see the injuries, you'll see limitations. And if you'll see limitations, you'll see disability. And disability is not part of our program and never will be. I would ask instead that you consider us outfitters and you consider our wounded warriors not as wounded warriors but as hunters. Hunters like you share any camp with. As outfitters, we host 102 wounded warriors a year on week-long adventures. The goal of that is not the kill, it's the experience. But like outfitters, we have issues and we sometimes have things we need to take care of. Sometimes our warriors get out of hand and we have to give them a tune-up. Other, other wounded warriors have brain farts, and forget things in camp. We have others that occasionally twist their knees. Some of our warriors are afraid of bears, others of alligators, and a couple times a year, our warriors are reminded that even rifles bite. But as outfitters, 
We often know the capabilities of our warriors, of our hunters, more than they know themselves. We put them in challenging situations, and we challenge them to go beyond their expectations and discover abilities they didn't think they had, or abilities that they thought were lost on the distant battlefields. Every once in a while, the stars align, the pieces of the puzzle fall together, and we're rewarded with moments like this. Moments that only a hunter can truly understand. Where one minute you're on the brink of sheer exhaustion, and the other you're standing there with the strength of Superman and standing taller than you ever have before, even without legs. We push our warriors to climb towards their summit, to go higher than they've ever thought they could go and accomplish things that they didn't think they could do. Many will see this, as we do as sheep hunters. And when they stand there and absorb this, they will see what I see. They will not see mountaintops. They will not see jagged peaks. What they will see are spires, spires of a grand cathedral that at that moment, on that day, was created for and belonged to them. As they stand there, they will still be wounded, and they will be for life, but they will no longer be defined by those wounds. They will be part of a new brotherhood with a new definition. They will be hunters, and every one of them will have the heart, desire, and determination of a sheep hunter. As I leave here tonight, I leave a very lucky man. I have a wife that I love very much that I've, has put up with my hunting addiction for the last 30 years, and together we have two sons. Over the last couple of years, the way we see it, our family's grown. We now have over 700 sons and one very special daughter. But I'm lucky for other reasons. I'm lucky because I have heroes in my life. Heroes like my dad and my cousins that sacrificed to preserve the freedom that I no longer take for granted. Some of those heroes are here with me tonight, and I'm lucky to be sitting at their table. Others are scattered through this room that I don't know, but equally respect. But I have other heroes in my life. Men and women that take that freedom and put it to work put it to work preserving the wildlife and the wild lands that I cherish and that give me the opportunity to introduce that world to our warriors that fought to protect it. Those heroes are also in this room tonight. It's each and every one of y'all. I thank you for your service. I thank you for all that you do. And I just ask you one thing in closing. Please never take your freedom for granted. <clears throat> it comes at such a very high price. <clears throat>